Good evening. I'm Dr. Georges Benjamin, and welcome to the 12th webinar in the COVID-19 conversation series brought to you by the American Public Health Association and the National Academy of Medicine. Today's webinar is entitled, Managing Ongoing Surges, Lessons from the Front Lines. Today's webinar has been approved for one and a half education credits for CHESS, CME, CNE, and CPH. None of the speakers has any relevant financial relationships to disclose. Please note that if you want continuing education credit, you should have registered with your first and last name. Now, everyone who wants credit must have their own registration and watch today's event in its entirety. All of the participants today will receive an email within a few days from cpd at confex.com. That's cpd at confex.com with information on claiming credits. All online evaluations must be submitted by September the 9th, 2020 to receive continuing education credit. Now, if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to address today or on future webinars, please enter them in the Q&A box or mail us at APHA at APHA.org. That's putting them in the Q&A box or emailing us at APHA at APHA.org. Now, if you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please enter your questions in the Q&A. Please pay attention to the chat for announcements on how to troubleshoot. We put those in from time to time. Now, this webinar will be recorded, and the recording and transcript will be available at COVID19conversations.org. Now, more information on the series and recordings of past webinars are also available at this link. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Michelle Walensky. Dr. Walensky is Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases and a practicing infectious disease physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Her primary research interests focus on model-based analysis of the cost effectiveness of HIV testing, care, and prevention strategies to inform HIV AIDS policy internationally as well as domestically. In addition to leading to our infectious disease faculty on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic, she's published COVID-19 related editorials and original science. Dr. Walensky has been instrumental in advising local, national, and international leaders on testing methodologies and implementation strategies as it translates to developing public health policies and guidelines. Dr. Walensky, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. George. It's been a pleasure to be here. Today's webinar will focus on what lessons we can apply today to slow the ongoing transmission and increase in hospitalizations, address the shortages of PPE, and prevent our healthcare and public health systems from becoming overwhelmed. We will hear from large hospital and healthcare provider systems, as well as public health leaders who have been on the front lines of the response and prevention of COVID-19. We are currently experiencing the highest levels of new cases daily as the virus surges in new communities around the country. Our panelists can give us a firsthand look at their experiences in dealing with the pandemic and share the lessons they have learned from their various pers varied perspectives. I thought I would give you a, for a few minutes to just take a look at mine. Great. So this is a, a graph that we had that we looked at every day in our incident command um, in Mass, at Mass General during our surge. Um, it's a graph that looks at our entire system, which you can see by the by the. Um, dark line, as well as that at MGH specifically, our system has 12 hospitals, MGH and the Brigham's are two of them, as well as smaller community hospitals. But let's just look at MGH, and this was our daily graph, which you can see in gold. And you can see between March 12th and April 16th, we had zero patients and we escalated to 367 pages with co uh, patients with COVID-19 in just a month period of time. What we also did is uh, we could map that on the we could map those that surge, but we also used data from Italy and other places to project what we might be expecting, and that's sort of the hazy lines. We use mathematical models to do that to to anticipate what we might expect, and we looked at uh, data from Italy, which, which was about two weeks ahead of us to um, specifically model. Uh, next slide, please. 
We also looked, and this is, I think is really important at our ventilator use, and this was something we kept a close eye on. What you can see, and this was Mass General specifically, what you can see is that dotted red line across, the, um, across at 43 ventilator use, uh, 43 patients on ventilators. That is our standard average of patients on ventilators at Massachusetts General Hospital. During our peak um, in, on April 19th, April 18th, we had 187 patients who were ventilated at a given time. So more than fourfold our standard ventilator use. Um, almost all of them, of course, had COVID-19 or were a COVID risk. And we still had numerous patients who were, who had, um, who were ventilated for other reasons. Next slide. So what I thought I would do is just give you a sense of some of the lessons that we learned in our first wave. First, um, it was February 24th, I remember it vividly, where I sat in the microbiology lab and we said, um, do we develop a test? We didn't know how big this was going to be. There were a few scattered cases in Seattle and maybe one or two in California. We had no idea what was coming. Um, and we had to make a big executive decision as to whether we were going to um, divert some of our resources, not do certain labs um, that we were normally doing and really put all hands on deck to create a test. Um, we decided to go ahead and do so and this was probably the best decision or one of the best decisions we made during our, our epidemic. We were um, ultimately testing the second largest number of patients in all of Massachusetts. The next thing is a division that we did is we, um, remember this is early March, we decided to convene a group that would create overall treatment guidance. What were we going to do when patients come, came in the door and how were we going to treat them? This was a team that looked through Med Archive and all the best available data all the time to ensure that we were giving the, the patients the best standard of care that we could based on the, the combing the literature that was out there. We also created a team for crisis standards of care. Um, this, was, this was really sobering. It's the first time I've ever seen documents like this in this country, where we talked about who would get ventilators, who would get dialysis machines, how would we distribute remdesivir during these critical times if and when it came to a point where we did not have enough of all of these critical resources. And then a really fun thing that came from this actually and really helpful and informative was a group that we called our CHANT team, which is still quite active, COVID Here and Now. This is a team that met daily for over um, 75 days in a row um, by Zoom and went over what we knew and patient patient discussions. There were many people who were working with patients who were seeing patients on the front lines and didn't know how to manage them. And it was a group, and I think by the, you know, by in our peak, we had 90 people, a multidisciplinary team on the phone to help people manage patients. More now, often we are um, hearing talks from, um, from other services, from infectious, not infectious disease, such as surgery or, um, or hematology or cardiology about what they've learned in their specific fields, dermatology. And so this has really been a multidisciplinary team um, where we not only uh, look at patient care, but also look at, at talks and, and from people on the, on the front lines. We developed a clinical trials team. What became very clear is we, as we were scaling up clinical trials that um, we ultimately might have more trials than all the patients that uh, would be available to enroll in them. And um, that we needed to have some sort of strategy as to which patients patients were eligible for which trials and how we would prioritize who would be um, enrolled in which. Um, I became part of a group of citywide ID chiefs where we met weekly to, to, to strategize and discuss things that were happening across the city and across the state to see if there was coordination across the state that would help us. And then it became very clear that um, our, our teams in the hospital needed infection control support. And that was not just to support our infection control team, but that as, um, especially in March, as every day um, people were discussing what is an aerosolizing generating procedure, who needs an N95, who can get away with a surgical mask, um, were surgical masks needed for everyone. There was a lot of infe infection control support that was needed um, in the hospital, on the front lines, on general medical floors to just make sure that people were following the right protocols and understanding the reasons behind them. It was a time of great confusion. We had, um, as everybody is feeling, uh, discussions of, with, about vulnerable populations. At one point, over 40% of our patients with um, with COVID in the hospital were Spanish only speaking. Um, this of course was a real challenge. They did not have a lot of support. They were, you know, we were wearing a lot of PPE. Their family members were not with them. And we uh, convened a group of physicians and care providers from across the hospital who spoke Spanish so that they could always be around for these patients. 
Communication has been key through all of this. Um, I started uh, full division-wide meetings um, early on and had uh, division-wide meetings every other day for all, all of our surge while our incident command was active. Um, and I've gotten a lot of feedback about how many times I said, I don't know the answer to that, but it was very helpful for, I think, people to hear what we knew and what we were learning um, and just to have a quorum for people, a forum for people to be able to talk. I think um, early on, especially, and I would say still now, um, we had to maintain a huge amount of humility. On March 20th, um, we made the decision as a, as a, um, a healthcare system to, to go all masks for all personnel in the hospital at all times. Um, this was a huge decision. It was not entirely clear that, um, that those were needed at the time. It was not, there was some literature at the time suggesting or some editorial suggesting we were going overboard. Um, but I've, if you saw the most recent JAMA paper that showed that actually this is exactly when our um, our transmission rates to healthcare workers started to decline. This was really a function of seeing a lot of our healthcare workers get infected and it was very, it was a very scary time. Um, I want to just remind people that, that the caregivers need, um, need uh, help too, need to be cared for it as well. This has been extraordinarily stressful. Um, many people asking, while I'm on clinical service, should I even go home? Um, and it's really just been um, a very stressful time and we really need to remember not just to take care of our patients, but to take care of one another. And then finally, I will say um, there have been gifts in this, um, in this pandemic. Um, they're sometimes hard to find, but there have been extraordinary gifts. Um, I would say one of the biggest gifts that I understand from this or that I have felt from this is my ability and, and new network that I've found. My, it's been a, a, a potential, it's, it's been the possibility to cross disciplines, to work with people I had never even known, to work um, with our uh, supply chain folks and, and with people in higher education. And, and really, it's been an opportunity for, for me to meet new people and to create new relationships. And that I will, will take with me and, and value from, from this extraordinarily stressful, difficult and very sad time. So with that, those few comments, maybe what I will do is say, I'm very excited about the lineup that we have ahead. We are going to hear about, um, from, from these other systems, about, public, about how we can help public health, about how we can be better prepared, um, about what we are seeing and what we can expect. Certainly there are places across the country that are experiencing surges. There are other places that um, are in a lull and potentially just watching many outbreaks, worried about the further surges to come. So what I would like to do now is introduce my three esteemed pre uh, presenters. First, uh, Dr. Jonathan Lewin. Dr. Jonathan Lewin is currently the Executive Vice President for Health Affairs Emory, at Emory University, Executive Director of the Woodruff Health Sciences Center, and President, CEO, and Chairman of the Board of Emory Healthcare. He also serves as a Professor of Radiology and Imaging Sciences and Professor of Biomedical Engineering in the Emory School of Medicine and Professor of po Health Policy and Management in the Rollins School of Public Health. Lewin is a national uh, leader in academic medicine strategy and integrated healthcare delivery and an international scientific leader in interventional and intraoperative MRI. Prior to his appointment at Emory, Dr. Lewin served as the Martin Donner Professor and Chairman of the Russell H. Morgan Department of Radiology and Radiological Sciences at Johns Hopkins University and the radiology, radiological science, uh, Radiologist in Chief at Johns Hopkins Hospital from 2004 to 2016, with secondary appointments as the Professor of Oncology, Neurosurgery, and Biomedical Engineering. From 2012 to 2016, he also served as the co-chair for strategic planning, and from 2013 to 2016 as senior vice president for integrated healthcare delivery for Johns Hopkins Medicine. Before joining the faculty of Johns Hopkins, Dr. Lewin was the director of the Division of Magnetic Resonance Imaging at University Hospitals of Cleveland and professor of vice and vice chairman for research and academic affairs in the Department of Radiology at Case Western Reserve University. Our second speaker will be Mr. Greg Adams. Mr. Adams is nationally recognized and a champion of healthcare transformation, improving access, and advocating for better health outcomes. 
Mr. Adams, since his, uh, since his time with Kaiser Permanente, has been driving a comprehensive work focused on growing the organization's membership, improving affordability for members, and transforming and, and expanding access to care. Mr. Adams has 30 years of leadership experience as a senior healthcare executive and has played an integral role in leading the transformation and improvement of patient care outcomes at Kaiser Permanente. In addition, Mr. Adams has been a key leader in driving Kaiser Permanente's mission of providing healthcare quality and coverage for its 12.14 million members. Mr. Adams is a, board of the, is a member of the Board of the Directors of America's Health Insurance Plans and a Board of Trustees of the American Nurses Foundation. He is also both a governor and steward within the health and healthcare community at the World Economic Forum. Additionally, Mr. Adams is a member of the National Association of Health Services Executives and the Executive Leadership Council, and also serves on the board of directors for the Los Angeles Philharmonic Association. He is past member of the California Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and the California Hospital Association's Board of Trustees. And last but not least, Dr. Howard Zucker is Commissioner of Health for New York State. As the state's chief physician, Dr. Zucker leads initiatives to combat the opioid crises, strengthen environmental health, and end the AIDS epidemic in New York. Since his arrival at the helm of the New York State Department of Health, he has established a network of hospitals equipped to treat Ebola, implemented programs to address the threat of, of Zika, and spearheaded efforts to combat antimicrobial resistance and the recent measles outbreak. Dr. Zucker oversaw the launch of the state's mar medical marijuana program and continues to update the programs to accommodate its evolving needs. He developed numerous campaigns to address major public health issues, including le lead contamination, Legionella, breast cancer screenings, and vaping-associated illnesses. His extensive review of scientific literature led the state to reject, reject hydrofracking in its borders. As commissioner, Dr. Zucker presides over the state's Medicaid program, the New York State Public Health and Health Planning Council, and the Wadsworth, and the Wadsworth Center, New York's premier public health lab. He also oversees the entire healthcare workforce as well as healthcare facilities, including hospitals, long term care, and nursing homes. In his previous role as, as first deputy commissioner, Dr. Zucker worked for, on the State Department of Health's preparedness and response initiatives in natural disasters and emergencies. He collaborated closely with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and other health-related entities in the city. A native of the Bronx, Dr. Zucker earned his MD from George Washington University School of Medicine at the age of 22, becoming one of America's youngest doctors. He is board certified in six specialties and subspecialties and trained in pediatrics at Johns Hopkins Hospital, anesthesia at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania, pediatric cl critical care um, medicine and pediatric anesthesiology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and pediatric cardiology at Children's Hospital Boston Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Zucker also holds a JD from Fordham University School of Law, Law School, an LLM from Columbia Law School, and a postgraduate diploma from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So it is my great pleasure to introduce these three panelists for you. And with that, I will uh, head it over to Dr. Lewin. Please take it away. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Walensky, for that, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you all today. I've been asked to share some of Emory Healthcare's lessons learned so far, uh, because of course, when it comes to COVID-19, we're still learning every day. I like the, to think of the analogy that we're building the airplane as we fly, as we look at, think through our uh, pandemic response. Uh, kind of next slide, please. Well, if you take the airplane analogy, as we took off, there was clearly some very turbulent air. Uh, the chart on the left is our persons under investigation, uh, test pending presumed COVID, uh, plus the confirmed COVIDs. And as you can see, we started uh, with our first COVID, right, first COVID admission right around March 9th or so. Uh, by March 12th, we had 14. And in two days, we went from 14 to 119. And over the next four days, we went from 119 to over 200. So it really started to look at the in uh, mid-March, like we were following the trajectory of Italy as we've had a very rapid increase. So at 
really uh, caused us by the beginning of March to think, pretty, look, look at all hands on deck, to think how could we as a system really work towards uh, addressing what was clearly going to be the crisis uh, of the generation for Emory Healthcare as we moved forward. Uh, next slide, please. Well, we were fortunate to build on a base of the last uh, four years or so where we had been implementing a lean operating system and lean executive management culture. So we had uh, already implemented around a thousand frontline daily huddles, 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m., which rolled up through a series of four other tiers to a tier five huddle in our C-suite at 9.45 every day. So those communication muscles from the front line to the C-suite were already very strongly built when we started this out. Um, so when we needed to uh, address this very quickly, we created an incident command center structure, or activated our incident command center structure, which included a breadth of interdisciplinary experts and stakeholders in 12 initial work groups, including very strong physician engagement. And these included many of uh, the similar groups that Dr. Walensky mentioned, a group on operations, infection prevention, communication, data analytics, uh, really across the board, uh, everything we thought we would touch, we had it represented. We started off having three Zoom incident command center group meetings, each an hour long, uh, along with one or two each weekend day. Uh, with strict templates to try to run through these 12 work groups efficiently and effectively. Then uh, in addition, we had two daily leadership meetings where I would lead, uh, meet with the five other incident commanders uh, each day for two hours. So we could look at what was working, what wasn't working and make adjustments in real time. We pretty much tried to measure anything that could be measured to have a very data driven uh, decision process. We created broadly available dashboards, which were transparent across the organization. And we also, like Mass General, very early developed an ethics triage committee to start to deal with what would happen if we needed to, in fact, start uh, um, rationing care because of lack of ventilators, remdesivir, or otherwise. Uh, next slide. One of the first challenges we had had to do with uh, the surgery precipice, as I like to think. Uh, next slide. Uh, as we looked at trying to manage our increasing, rapidly increasing volume of uh, COVID patients, we realized that we did not have the PPE to continue a full surgical schedule as well as take care of these patients. So as you can see from the graph, we uh, stopped surgery abruptly, stopped all our ambulatory surgery and limited our inpatient surgery to only those truly emergent cases. Uh, and it had two, uh, two effects. One was it freed up the staff to repurpose to COVID patients, uh, but it also repurposed, it allowed us to free up the supplies we needed for our EDs, for our wards, for our COVID positive uh, patients across the system. The second impact was the financial one. Uh, you can imagine, uh, like most health systems, our bottom line is driven by our surgery and other elective procedures, like imaging, like lab. That also dropped like a brick. So that created a second challenge for us as we work to move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Well, the first challenge I really want to spend some time on is the PPE challenge. Like most big health systems, uh, we have 11 hospitals, over 200 outpatient centers. Uh, like most, uh, we had a very much a just-in-time uh, supply chain. We would have twice daily deliveries to each of our hospitals. Uh, we tried to minimize our inventory and our warehouses uh, with very frequent supply. So when the Wuhan China uh, epidemic hit and our supply chains broke, uh, we were in big trouble. So we very quickly had to look at how do we do alternative sourcing? We did very many creative things, including having a, uh, an upholstery manufacturer down in uh, South Georgia repurpose their lines for cloth masks and cloth gowns. 
we went straight to China to some of the suppliers who still were in business and had chartered airplanes bringing supplies for us for masks. We collaborated with our Department of Biomedical Engineering and Georgia, Techs, Georgia Tech to manufacture our own 3D printed uh, face shields. And we worked with a, a number of donors from across the city. We uh, started off a donation site where we received tens of thousands of N95 and KN95 masks from Home Depot, from Lowe's, uh, hundreds of thousands of gloves were donated as well, really to keep us going through those first very challenging uh, months or at least weeks. Uh, next slide. One of the things that was really one of the big silver linings for us was that things that as a major academic medical center would have taken us three to six months to make a decision with this sort of very uh, classic academic uh, decision-making processes. We were with our incident command center and having all the stakeholders on the phone, for, uh, on the Zoom for two or three hours a day. We were able to make uh, some of these month-long decisions in a week. And things that would have taken a, two weeks to a month, we were able to get done in a day or two. So we launched a number of new and updated system-wide policies and procedures for about masking, visitation, temperature screening, testing, N95 mask distribution and reprocessing within days. Uh, we were able to stand up multiple drive-through testing centers, off-site acute respiratory clinics, virtual outpatient management clinics for follow-up, creating separate entryways for our EDs for respiratory versus other patients uh, very quickly within the first week or two. And prior to uh, COVID, we did literally around 100 telehealth visits in the whole month of February. We ramped that up within about two to three weeks to 3,000 telehealth visits per day, now having done over 200,000 telemedicine virtual clinic visits. Uh, next slide. Innovation also became critical. Like Mass General, we started when uh, we first saw this hit in late February, we started uh, talking with our laboratorians around how to create our own test. And uh, when the state of Georgia Department of Public Health was only able to do around 20 to 40 tests per day, we were ramped up all the way to 80 to 100 tests. So we were fortunate. We were doing, again, more tests than the uh, than DPH and actually CDC had very limited testing at that point as well. Um, so we, start, we very quickly uh, ramped that up. We actually were taking care of over 25% of the COVID patients for the state of Georgia, for the whole state within those first week or two. We developed new ways to clean, sterilize and reuse equipment. We innovated new ways for patients to communicate in the COVID ICUs with loved ones and with the team. Uh, we created and nationally disseminated clinical guidelines for ICU care across a number of different areas, coagulopathy management, again, ventilator management, proning patients. Mm -hmm. And we leveraged our academic research differentiator by leading national efforts around vaccine development. We were one of two sites in the country with the initial Moderna vaccine uh, phase one trial. Treatment development, we uh, enrolled more patients in the ACT-1 remdesivir trial than anywhere else in the world. And we continue to uh, innovate around clinical trials, uh, like, like uh, we heard from Dr. Walensky, along a number of different areas. Uh, next slide, please. We learned a lot from how do we deal with the tsunami of patients that were coming to us as the, the uh, major academic medical center for the state of Georgia. Very early, we created a symptom checker app that would allow us patients to assess their needs on their, on their iPhones and on the web. Oh, more than a million sessions with multiple repeat users. Um, we created a COVID hotline that's fielded over 80,000 calls from the people of Georgia, screening more than 20,000 people. And we we're very proud that we achieved extremely good patient outcomes. Uh, higher than 92% survival rate for our admitted patients, uh, which increases every month. Uh, next slide, please. 
The major thing that we saw was the importance of our people. We had to rapidly move all of our back office work uh, to full-time remote with the IT and otherwise uh, all the challenges we had uh, with that uh, redeployment. Uh, we had to redeploy frontline employees from things like perioperative services to the COVID units, to the drive-through testing areas. We had to redeploy uh, people who were front desk in our closed clinics to become screeners, uh, vis visitor screeners, temperature screeners. We had to figure out how to keep our um, employees safe. And we've tested now more than 7,000 of our 24,000 uh, Emory Healthcare employees. Uh, like Mass General, we created a mandated mask policy and we saw our uh, infection rates within Emory Healthcare plummet after we did that, uh, similar to what Mass General has published. And we also developed our own serology test, an antibody test for the uh, receptor binding domain of the virus. We've screened more than 11,000 of our Emory Healthcare team members with that test. But the most important thing was the importance of making sure morale was up. So on the right, you can see a note from uh, a, a community member. On the left uh, at the bottom, you can see our pharmacy people were writing personal notes uh, for the med meds going up to the COVID units. A lot of work on morale. Uh, next slide, please. So there are still headwinds and we continue uh, to see strong performance with great clinical outcomes uh, and are moving forward in our recovery. But as you can see, continued and growing surge in particular down in Georgia where we are, consumer confidence, the financial recovery and broader economy, the social unrest, fortunately Atlanta has been primarily peaceful and the uncertainty that we have when uh, certainly as schools reopen, we uh, can predict what might happen with COVID, but we really don't know. So uh, next slide. So my, la my last slide, our way forward and our advice to other hospitals and communities who are also facing outbreaks are to pre prepare for ongoing surges and resurgences. Um, we've re-engineered our operations for a world with COVID uh, for the next year or two. We're looking at, in essence, running two healthcare systems, a COVID system and a non-COVID system running in parallel to be able to keep all of the many patients who depend on us for their health care, for heart attacks, for transplantation, for brain surgery, to be able to take care of them while being able to flex up our COVID care uh, as needed without having to shut down the rest of the system. We've worked to mitigate supply chain risks, we're working at balancing the financial stewardship with our needs to invest in clinical recovery. We're working to ensure consumer confidence, working very closely with the, our peer health systems uh, within the city of Atlanta to, to reassure patients uh, that it's safe to come for their needed care. And we're working closely with local and state governments. We're leveraging the goodwill and support of our community. And most importantly, we're focusing on our people on continued engagement, on combating burnout, and on ensuring that, uh, again, what we do uh, to keep our people moving forward works well. And then last slide, I'd just like to thank everyone for your attention. I look forward to working through, uh, listening to many of the questions that you might have. So Dr. Walensky, back to you, thank mm -hmm. you. Many thanks, Dr. Lewin. Extraordinary efforts um, ongoing and, and in the last numerous months. Mr. Adams, can you uh, please tell us about what about the Kaiser Permanente experience? You may be on mute. Good, I think we've connected. So first, I'm um, pleased to follow my good friend and colleague, John. Um, he shared uh, a great deal of what I am going to share. Um, but I think the model of, of building a plane while one is flying is really very appropriate for what we're all experiencing. Um, so thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I thought I'd share just a little bit about Kaiser Permanente. Um, you heard that we're 12.4 million members. We're the country's largest 
leading integrated um, delivery system, health plan, hospital providers. We are 75 years, for 75 years, our mission has been to provide high quality, affordable health care and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. The community piece is very real for us and the way we show up and lead and approach um, the COVID-19 pandemic is somewhat different from others. We have a really bright um, community health officer who's a part of our leadership team that's playing a role. We've got amazing scientists, infection disease specialists that are working with us. And throughout this process, I've been able to kind of immerse myself in the middle of that group and learn and push and lead. And it's been innovative, it's been challenging, um, and it's also at times been extremely hard to take. Um, we've had, unfortunately, a number of our employees that through community spread, potentially at work, um, who are no longer with us. So this is uh, you know, a very serious time for healthcare and our healthcare um, providers on the front line. We have 39 hospitals, 114 ambulatory outpatient centers, MOBs, 219,000 employees, 63,000 of those nurses, and 23,000 amazing um, physicians. Today, actually to date, we have out of our 12.4 million members, um, about 114,000 members that have tested positive. And today, as we sit here in our hospitals and in our planned hospitals, we have 1,000, almost 500 um, patients that are in our hospitals and our ICUs and, and receiving care. So we started, uh, I think we saw our first patient in February. Um, glad to, um, to know that that individual went home in May and is doing well. Um, but we, through our, again, our data, our scientists, our infectious disease specialists, began to kind of monitor what we identified as leading indicators. And we have very large call centers um, and I'll speak specifically about our Northern California call center. Um, and in March, kind of February, March, we saw our volumes go from three to 4,000 calls a day related to flu, um, questions about COVID, flu-like symptoms to from three to 4,000 to 13,000, which was just unprecedented. And we actually Reach a, reached um, at our peak about 67, in this one call center, 67,000 calls per week. So it was very clear to us that we were beginning to experience community spread. And remember, we were been focused on containment and we began pretty immediately to advocate for um, our states and our nation to move from containment to mitigation. Uh, we were very concerned about not only that we manage the appropriate and the right levels of care in our communities, but also about exposure of our staff and our physicians and our clinicians as we were kind of not focused on the fact that this was now in the community. Um, we established three priorities for our organization that we've continued to follow. One was that we would educate and care for our members, our patients, and our communities. Um, the second one, which is one that we took very seriously and continue, was that we would maintain the safety of our frontline staff um, and our physicians. And then the third one was that all hands had to be on deck in order for us to prepare for the surge. And, and like um, Emory and John, we implemented a national command center. Um, and, and you know, I think our culture is called to question during moments like these. And we um, have been kind of a multi-regional organization. Um, I had recently come to be the CEO of Kaiser Permanente. And one of my um, kind of charges to the organization was the need for us to move toward being a single enterprise. And COVID and the challenge of the pandemic offered that opportunity for us. So we came together with the National Command Center over this period of time, we um, have operated as a single enterprise as we've addressed COVID. We've published some 28 um, playbooks, um, a return to work playbook, um, mitigation playbook. Um, and of course, we moved pretty immediately to deal with the surge. And, and, and I'll talk a little bit about California because um, we're probably 80, 85% in California. 
And, and the models that we were looking at in California suggested that we could, in, we could see an increase in our inpatient um, capacity by some 6,000 hospitalizations at the time. And we were working with the state of California. Uh, that was at the very early, a 20% 20, 20 attack rate. We, we later decreased that. But we, during that period of time, increased our inpatient capacity in California by 2,600 beds. Um, we shifted um, staff from ambulatory to inpatient. We used our ambulatory facilities and set them up for inpatient facilities. We worked with the Los Angeles County, with um, Common Spirit um, a Health System to set up a surge hospital in Los Angeles. We did that in a matter of four weeks. Um, like John, we saw our virtual care um, shift from, we were at 20% to 70% um, in the mid-Atlantic. We've got big medical office buildings and we worked with um, the states there to really set those up as temporary hospitals. Um, and we, like everyone, suspended elective surgery. I mean, there've been questions about, should we have suspended elective procedures? I think we absolutely should have. I don't think it would have been possible for us to really manage all that we were managing without being able to suspend. And I think it also, of course, helped with, um, with the, the, the whole transmission, reducing transmission. In terms of just our staff, and um, you know, um, we are an organization that's largely unionized. We have the oldest and the longest running labor management partnership in the country. Um, and our employees and our labor partners rose to the occasion in an amazing way. I, I remember sitting at home at my dining room table one evening at six, seven o'clock in the evening, calling companies, trying to get PPE equipment. And one of our labor leaders with SEIU was doing the same. Um, our, we have two um, coalitions, uh, two, uh, two groups of, of labor partners. Um, and our nurses, um, UNAC, was there with us advocating that we move from containment to mitigation. We continued, like John, to engage with our employees through this process. Um, one of the most rewarding experiences for me was over a two or three week, two or three week period, I actually held conference calls with some 10 or seven labor stewards that were on the front line. And they were able to talk to me about what I was articulating and what they were experiencing. And I was able to go back to our leadership team and our command center and really help them to deliver on what we had committed to our employees in terms of safety and in terms of education. Um, so our employees being on the journey, being the people that were helping us to innovate and, and frankly still are, um, is, is a, a, a silver lining in all of this. The other thing that we did, and I'll be quick here, was to, we did look at how do we acknowledge and reward um, kind of what our employees were going through. I mean, you know, coming into work, being concerned about going home, being concerned about whether or not one could be taking the virus. So we did a number of things. We implemented um, an 80 hour paid leave for any employee who um, was tested positive, where the, it was at work or not at work, the, the, the contact was at work or not at work. We implemented a childcare grant for our employees um, during that intensive period. We came up with strategies for our people so that if they didn't want to go home, we provided temporary shelters um, for them, and we're continuing to do that. Um, and we established a help center that is, is currently in place. We, like John, and you're going to hear from others, had the PPE challenge. Um, we are a very large organization. We use a tremendous amount of PPE um, uh, we, during this period of time. Um, and as you heard me say, we're all looking at sourcing and doing the kinds of things that, that John mentioned, including making shields, et cetera. So where are we now? Um, as I said, we've had about 119,000 of our members who have tested. Today, as we sit here, we've got about 1,500 people who are hospitalized nationwide. We protect, we've, pro um, um, we've really improved our our model of predicting. We have a 21 day um, model that predicts where we will be. Um, we are operating at about 30% increase in capacity. 
Um, right now, today, we have about 19% increase. Um, and we are beginning to see, and I know we've got stories about where we are in the surge, but we are beginning to see indicators that suggest in some of our markets, especially California, that we're beginning to see things stabilize. I, I'd like to leave us with a couple of thoughts. One is the issue of testing is huge. It is the PPE. Um, we are targeting and are trying to get to about 20,000 tests per day. We've got many instruments. We've talked to the CEOs of the instrument companies. And I think as a, as a nation, we're, not, we're kind of missing that this is a world pandemic when it comes to PPE and testing. And these multinational companies are having to source all of that. So our being creative, really looking at how we get more instruments, more tests, we're looking at pooling um, is a big one for us. The issue of suppression is something that we are not talking as much about and I think we must talk about. Um, as we try to reopen, we see the surge, we see the transmission. In many of our counties, we don't have the resources for um, contact tracing, for we don't have the, the boots on the ground, as I say. We're working with those counties, but this is um, a time for us to recognize our public health organizations and the need for resources. Um, and I think um, as we lead and as we advocate, if we're going to get through the next year or two, we've got to own the need for people to be in our communities that are educating, that are, um, doing the contact tracing, helping people who may not understand to isolate, to quarantine. Uh, and so we're at a place now where um, our specialists, our chief health officer are working with us to put a number of programs together to really help our communities understand um, their role and how they can protect um, themselves and their neighbors. So thank you. Mr. Adams, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for those comments. Maybe we will then now turn to Dr. Zucker. Um, Dr. Hold on. Great, here I am. The video should come on. It says the host has stopped the video, so perhaps um, someone can help on that. Any luck? Okay, thank you. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am uh, grateful to the American Public Health Association and to the uh, National Academy of Medicine for inviting New York State to share our story of managing and reversing an epic surge in COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, um, and deaths. On, uh, on March 1st, uh, New York began this difficult and very perilous, but ultimately instructive journey uh, on how to maintain public health. In partnership with every New Yorker, we flattened the curve. Uh, we brought down our infection rates to around 1%. Uh, we brought down our hospitalizations from about 18,825, which was on April 12th at its peak, uh, to under 600 uh, today, uh, the lowest number during the pandemic. Uh, we brought down the number of fatalities from a tragic high that we, we had around uh, 800 uh, to less than five today. The broad scale public cooperation allowed New York to avert the direct epidemiologic uh, predictions and prevent the 100,000 dangerous infections uh, that were initially uh, predicted. And despite this success, we know that our state and, and our nation remain in the grips of uh, this global public health crisis, the likes of which we really haven't seen in decades. And for that matter, probably not in, um, uh, in probably a century when you think about the numbers. Um, so unlike New York, the states in the South and the West have, um, are, have been seeing an increase in the COVID-19 infections in Arizona. Uh, the doctors are rationing tests in, in emergency rooms. In Florida, I heard that there are uh, no free ICU beds in, in about 50 or so hospitals. Uh, and the sole hospital in a remote Texas uh, county uh, seems so overwhelmed from what I'm hearing is that they were considering sending some um, people home uh, who are COVID patients, but they're least likely are the ones who are least likely to survive. But having been at the brink ourselves, our hearts do go out to all of our fellow, uh, fellow Americans suffering through this crisis. But much of the suffering uh, could be linked to the state's reopening too soon or failing to establish adequate uh, testing and tracing systems. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that 
and choosing not to institute or enforce the statewide mask mandates, which we have been doing. So I guess the question is, what did New York do to beat back the surge uh, uh, and maintain one of the lowest infection rates in the country? And we recognize this is not over, and we also recognize that uh, there are risks uh, of this uh, coming back, but we're, we're trying to stay on top of it. We based our decisions on the facts, on the data, on the expert analysis. We were fully transparent with the public. We, we prioritized clear communication, uh, easy access to the most uh, current statewide and county data. Uh, I think maybe I touched the slide. Um, we prioritized testing and tracing. Uh, we prepared for the worst case scenario to the best of our ability uh, through critical partnerships. And we acknowledge and we clearly reported when the information guiding our decisions was no longer accurate or relevant. And we developed the contingency plans uh, and moved ahead. And we worked to establish a public trust. So New York slowed the virus spread through aggressive mitigation measures and widespread uh, public buy-in. Uh, limiting the non-essential gatherings, closing schools statewide, uh, shutting down in-office work for non-essential employees helps uh, stop the spread. While we did identify the emerging hospitals, uh, emerging hotspots, and we targeted the medical response to those hotspots, the one you see in the slide here is uh, the first uh, hotspot we had, which was in New Rochelle in Westchester County. Every decision about New York uh, on pause, as we called it, was applied statewide well beyond the hotspots as well. So the question people have asked is why, and, and because we felt that a single super spreader at a wedding, a sporting event, or any large gathering, which was what happened in New Rochelle, uh, can lead to dozens of infections and, and truly an overnight crisis, and that's what, uh, what happened. The government's daily briefings provide uh, New Yorkers with a sense of continuity that had been lost with the lockdown and the unprecedented uh, social situations uh, which we found ourselves in. Uh, next slide, please. The department launched a COVID-19 tracker webpage uh, to provide daily testing uh, data to the public, and that's the uh, sample of the page from uh, uh, back um, on the um, 14th of, of July. The tracker maps and, and graphs statewide and county level testing results and fatalities by the county, which you can see in the map, by age, by sex, and by comorbidities. Uh, we create a regional consortium uh, with New Jersey, with Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, uh, I'm sorry, Delaware, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts to ensure a consistent reopening actions uh, along bordering states and to develop a regional supply chain for PPE and uh, uh, as well as other equipment. And New York was the first state to mandate masks uh, in mid-April, and that was a decision based on, on the scientific data that was new at that time about aerosol uh, spread that the world was not aware of at the beginning of March. As, as we've said, this is information, new information that comes in, uh, and we were adjusting accordingly. The trajectory of the pandemic revealed that the most effective actions for containing uh, coronavirus was uh, work to identify positive cases through diagnostic testing, uh, aggressively trace and test the contacts of those who test positive, and isolate those who are infected. We've been working aggressively on this. Uh, maintain public buy-in throughout, uh, uh, through social distancing uh, and mask wearing uh, throughout the entire state. Uh, establish, track, and enforce metrics for continued local and statewide uh, safety. Uh, next slide, please. So the issue of laboratory testing has been something which everyone has spoken about. So when COVID-19 emerged, only the CDC was permitted to test for the virus, which really did uh, result in, as we've heard, a limited number of tests. So the Department of Health developed its own testing method, and the state secured the FDA authorization to use the test, and that was on February 29th, actually uh, a day before our, our first case. Since then, we have developed uh, the most extensive COVID-19 testing operation uh, in the world. The, the state leads uh, the nation in the world in per capita diagnostic testing. We've done uh, just about 5.8 million uh, tests of uh, persons have been tested. We're testing between about 70 to 80,000 persons per day. We have about 760 testing sites across the state and, and downstate in New York City, we have about 225 testing sites. A lot of the cases initially were in, this, in the city area. Our positivity rate is fluctuating around 1%. And for comparison, early this week, uh, California's positivity rate was at 8%. Florida was uh, uh, around 19%. <laughs> next slide. The, and, and so this, this next slide looks at this issue of contact tracing. So we worked with various partners to address the continued high infection rates of low income and minority communities in New York City. It's one of the challenges that this uh, uh, hit those communities uh, uh, heavily. Uh, so we increased testing sites at public housing developments and at churches and community-based providers in pre predominantly the minority communities. 
Uh, we partnered with Bloomer Philanthropies. Uh, we built a nationally replicable uh, COVID-19 uh, tracing program, 30 contact traces for every uh, 100,000 individuals uh, <clears throat> out there. Uh, that number varies a little bit. Uh, the Bloomberg School and the department developed an online curriculum for the state contact traces and the result to save lives is providing technical and operational advice. A, a key number worth, worth knowing is that we have about 44,000 uh, contacts we've done and we've done about over 24,000 cases so far. Uh, next slide, please. The department developed one of the nation's first and most accurate tests uh, for to detect COVID-19 antibodies in an individual's blood. This is an interesting slide. I'm gonna go through this uh, a little bit uh, in detail. This test enabled the state to launch the nation's largest antibody, a random survey, about 15,000 samples, and it was conducted at grocery stores uh, and community centers across the state. You can see on the left, we just sampled them in April, then again in June. We looked at all across the regions, numbers that were tested. You can see about 15,000 on the first one, 12,000 on the second. Uh, and we looked at the percent uh, that were, uh, were positive. We also tested our essential frontline uh, uh, workers, the healthcare workers, the first responders, transit workers, the members of the New York Police Department to determine the scale of infection. You can see that as well, whereas as first responders and, and the numbers of the healthcare workers were about 15.3%. Uh, percent. Uh, the critical data has been essential to our, our understanding of what measures are necessary for protection from the virus. <clears throat> so we're looking at that. In the bottom, you can see the New York State Police, which had about 2.7% uh, positive. We could talk about this in the Q&A. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. As New York's uh, COVID-19 surge began in March, our 53,000 bed statewide capacity need to be drastically increased. This was a big concern to meet the demand because there were models suggesting up to 136,000 cases. Uh, and so to do so, we increased our capacity at our existing hospitals by at least 50%, some places 100%. We canceled all elective surgeries statewide uh, and we need to be pretty aggressive. We integrated the state's 23 public and the 200 private hospitals into a single tightly functioning surge and flex system to share patient information, supplies, and inventories. The purple uh, <clears throat> graph uh, line is the actual hospitalizations. But in the beginning, back in March there, we did not know which one of these curves we were going to end up following. And it, it was very um, anxiety provoking to not know whether we were going to go above our 53,000 uh, that we could uh, accommodate without a surge in flex. Next slide, please. We partnered. We partnered with FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers to create four equipped and staffed temporary hospitals downstate uh, and the president dispatched the thousand bed comfort, which is on the right there, uh, the US, US Navy comfort <clears throat> to uh, help us as well. We also faced a critical shortage of ventilators that we handled with help from the federal stockpile and the generosity of other states. States sent us uh, ventilators and philanthropic, uh, philanthropic partners as well and the ingenuity of our frontline hospitals to figure out how to convert different things uh, to get more um, uh, uh, ventilatory support to patients. We approved a protocol allowing BiPAP machines to be converted into ventilators. Uh, we acquired additional machines. We had a capacity of about 3,750. And then we used the anesthesia machines. There are a lot of operating rooms that obviously were not being used. So we used uh, those anesthesia machines, uh, which have ventilators obviously for 2,000 more patients. <clears throat> and then we looked for wherever ventilators were, ambulatory surgery centers, uh, uh, doctor's offices, or, or I should say group practices where they're doing procedures. And we worked on every front we could to get as, uh, as many ventilators as possible. Next slide. <clears throat> After the uh, peak of infections, as we headed down the mountain, uh, New York focused on establishing and forcing a data-driven statewide system. We determined that this was the only way to maintain a safe and a healthy operations and interactions as residents uh, re-entered uh, workplace and congregate spaces and resumed uh, public, uh, public activities. Our New York Forward uh, reopening strategy is, is found on a metric system. It's integrated within 10 designated regions. Our plan uh, requires a control group in each region to ensure that the infection rate remains less than one. <clears throat> That's a, a goal. Uh, and each day we monitor infections based on diagnostic testing. Uh, we look at the new possible cases based on contact tracing. Uh, we look at the healthcare capacity based, based on the rate of hospitalizations. And the state has consulted with experts at the University of Minnesota, Imperial College in London, to create an early warning dashboard, which is what you're seeing up there. And the dashboard shows the seven reopening metrics that control groups uh, in the state's 10 regions uh, track daily. And that's the testing and tracing, the new infections, the severity of infections, the hospital capacity. And we just uh, 
uh, watch that literally on a, on a daily basis. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what we didn't know, there was so much we didn't know at the outset of this crisis that would have made a world of difference. And there's still a lot that we don't know, as we all know. Uh, that the coronavirus coming from Europe and infected an estimated 10,000 people in New York City by mid-February. And this is because of open travel between New York and Europe. And this was way before New York's first case, which was on March 1st. Uh, so it was a lot of travel in New York, New York City, particularly. through asymptomatic spread. We didn't know that. Uh, we didn't know that because of the dangerous combination of, uh, of both aerosol uh, and asymptomatic spread, uh, mask wearing is an effective and essential means of preventing disease transmission. We know that the minority population would be at heightened risk for infections. 27.2% of the state's COVID-19 fatalities have been uh, in uh, African-Americans and 28.7% uh, Latinos. We didn't know that COVID-19 can attack any organ beyond the respiratory system uh, and does in fact pose a threat to children. I mean, we knew that it could, viruses can affect if you have kidney disease and other things, but we didn't think that this was as much of a threat to children because we had seen a lot of, we'd seen kids with it. And then we saw the frightening information about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And when that, this happened, we started looking in the state of New York. I called some of the hospitals about this. We, the numbers were just um, shocking. One hospital said, oh, we have 15 cases like that in the hospital right now. Uh, and so that's when we, uh, we worked hard on that issue as well, or, or started working uh, diligently on that. Next slide. It's also important to underscore the failures uh, that I believe the federal government had at critical points throughout this ongoing crisis. Uh, notable, notably, both the CDC's two-month delay in the national availability of an effective diagnostic test and the nation's lack of a coordinated medical supply uh, chain led to the situation that we were sitting in in New York and, and, uh, and originally and other states in March and April. Uh, right now, the states especially need assistance with diagnostic testing and new escalating regional testing needs are putting pressure on the national analytical labs. So it's taking up to nine days to get some of these test results, which obviously uh, is uh, far from ideal. Uh, and when that happens, you really do fall behind the virus. Um, we are fortunate that our lab and our lab capacity across the state has been um, uh, ramped up. Uh, Science-based national guidance on mask wearing and school reopening is essential. The school reopening issue is a is a, is a tough one and we all know that. But what we're seeing instead is something shocking. Some of the new CDC guidance on reopening schools was written uh, actually by the White House officials rather than by the health experts. The only national level leadership on mask wearing is actually coming from the corporate world. Obviously, uh, uh, we are and other states uh, are doing that. But CBS, Walmart, Target, McDonald's, Apple, Costco, a lot of those companies are, are doing that. And New York's uh, record for the state with the most coronavirus cases was uh, recently eclipsed, as you can see in the slide, by some of our, um, our other uh, big states, California, Florida, uh, Texas, uh, I think uh, maybe there, I'm not sure yet. Last slide. So New York went, next slide, please. Um, thank you. New York went, uh, has gone from the worst afflicted to the best managed state during this uh, global pandemic. I, I know this has been a lot of work on the part of many people. We hope our lessons from bending the curve will help other states avoid the crisis that we found ourselves in when we began. Uh, we've managed to get ahead of the virus rather than uh, uh, catching up behind it, but um, we are determined not to, uh, not to fall behind and, and we are doing everything that we can to be sure uh, that uh, New York is staying safe. We recognize that, that the pandemic is still going on. We, we are diligently uh, doing everything from the contact tracing, all the things I mentioned before, because we realize that this can come back in New York uh, uh, even though our numbers are 1% positive right now, uh, we are concerned that we don't want this to, um, uh, to have a resurgence and, and we're trying to work diligently on that. So thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Zucker. Those were three terrific talks. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to start uh, having conversations about some things that perhaps we didn't discuss or we can dive a little bit deeper. One of the things that um, we uh, encountered probably um, well, early on was um, that we hadn't had enough communication with our downstream partners that people while we were starting to become ready to receive patients with COVID-19 and to diagnose patients with COVID-19, um, our dialysis partners, our SNFs, our long-term care facilities were not necessarily as able to receive them when they were ready for discharge. And this um, was created some challenges in terms of um, uh, Dis disposition and be able to end and backup of patients because we needed to empty our hospital beds. I'm wondering um, if each of you had those challenges and how you navigated that. 
maybe. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a stab at it. We, we did have that challenge and, and actually in a number of our states, including the state of California, the issues in our nursing homes were very serious in terms of PPE supplies, in terms of training of staff. Um, and so we, the hospitals all came together and actually worked with a number of the nursing homes to address um, the training. Um, the state um, supported them in terms of PPE in California. Um, but the issue that we had that was even, I shouldn't say more challenging, but, but also challenging was people did not want to return to them. Um, and they didn't necessarily, families didn't necessarily want them. And so we've had a number of incidents where um, individuals came from nursing homes you know, positive, ill, did not want to go back. And then we had the issue of how do we place them? And in some cases, the family was not um, the appropriate place or the families, as I said, didn't want to. But there's been a concerted effort, I think, from the hospitals, the hospital association in a number of our states to really work with the nursing homes. And our state leadership, especially in California, has really stepped up to kind of support and make sure they have supplies and, and um and that work is continuing. That's great, yeah. Dr. Lewin. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll echo that. We're, we're fortunate in that in our system, uh, we have a long-term acute care facility, part of the system. So if, when we have people who are still on ventilators who are really you know, at, or at uh, sort of maintenance, no longer needing really intensive care, but nowhere, nowhere to go, obviously, we are fortunate to be able to put them into our long-term acute care facility we also have our own 250 bed um, SNF, skilled nursing facility. So we, we also, uh, and, and we were fortunate that we contained COVID within our own facility. It was uh, very, you know, there's been relatively minimal uh, through, through the four months. Um, but we, we did have the same problem with the local um, uh, skilled nursing facilities. Once they transferred to us, they didn't want them back. Um, so it was really just working with, uh, working with them helping to assure uh, and reassure them that these patients were no longer infectious. And it's worked out, but it's, it, it has been one of the challenges as well. Dr. Zucker, if I could um, ask you numerous questions about how you um, enforced a mask mandate and how you were successful in contact tracing, which is truly one of the hardest parts of, of trying to contain slash mitigate. <laughs> sure. So I think two things. One is uh, with regards to the nursing home question, because we've been oh, doing them a lot. Uh, and um, I appreciate Dr. Bowen's comments, but that they are no longer infectious, uh, you know, nine days in the hospital and, and they're going back. And a lot of these individuals who came from the nursing homes also, you know, as we know, those who are elderly, you don't move them out of the nursing home so quickly if they're a little tired and they probably were symptomatic, uh, probably infectious days before they were symptomatic and symptomatic for a few days before they went to the hospital. And then, and then by the time they're in the hospital, we found that the average amount of time, median time is nine days in the hospital. And CDC was saying that it's about nine days, 10 days, when, you, when you're no longer infectious. But this is a big, it's been a, a, an issue that we've uh, looked at. We also found that the nursing homes, uh, the infection in the nursing homes was a result of, of uh, unfortunately, from uh, health of the nursing homes uh, staff bringing in completely, not of any fault of their own, just that they brought in asymptomatic spread. Uh, regarding masks, um, I think we were talking about this earlier today, and it's, a lot of this has to do with communication and getting the message out and, and getting people to recognize that this is good public health practice and to do the, you know, almost do the right thing on this issue when it comes to washing hands, social distancing, and wearing masks. And, and in New York, and that, well, for all the country right now, it's pretty warm. It's not the most comfortable thing to have a mask on. People want to go out. Uh, and I think it's sort of a, peer, a little bit of peer pressure, particularly in the younger population uh, between the age of about 18, 19, 20, up to into the, into the 30s because that is the group that we have noticed has been the biggest challenge right now uh, on this. And, and, um, uh, and we have had, uh, I just uh, wrote something and we just dealt with something out in the Hamptons where people had a concert uh, and they, uh, uh, they just didn't wear masks and didn't socially distance and uh, you get worried about that. Um, contact tracing? Oh, contact tracing, so okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, so our contact tracing program is pretty aggressive. We are, we are um, 
anytime there's a positive case, we actually are working with our counties uh, are, uh, in there and trying to track and try to find out who they're exposed to. Recently, we had, uh, well, I would say about three or four weeks ago, had someone who came from one of the uh, more affected states and came back for a party, a uh, graduation party. And sure enough, that became a big issue. And many people were infected and we jumped on that really quickly when we heard about that. But it does require a lot of uh, vigilance and, and to be sure uh, that we, we identify individuals uh, uh, as soon as we, we know. And, and it's a lot, I will have to tell you, it's a lot of work, uh, that, that issue. Uh, and I think, but I think that that's one of the most important things we can do. And given that we do have the capacity now to do a lot of testing, uh, that helps to move this forward as well. Dr. Lewin, maybe um, you can speak to whether we, there's a lot of conversation about ventilators and um, PPE shortage. Um, what other shortages? We experienced shortages with tube feeds, for example, um, which we didn't expect. I guess we should have expected, but you know, it wasn't necessarily the first thing. Propofol, sedation for our ventilated patients. What other shortages have you experienced? Um, are you through them? And, and what, um, what still are you experiencing? We're still recirculating or reusing and extended using our N95s, even though our surge is, is our first surge anyways behind us. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's fascinating the things that have short uh, supply chains. Because uh, I agree, you know, feeding tubes, you know, same, we had the same issue with, with some of the very simple things uh, that we usually do. Right now, you know, fortunately, you know, we, we got on the ball, we ordered 50 ventilators back in the uh, beginning of March, and they actually were delivered by the beginning of April. So we had, a, we had a, uh, facilities for, uh, you know, well over 350 ventilators in, in our facility. So we never, we, we have not yet, knock on wood, come short on ventilators. Um, but certainly many of the things like propofol, many of these routine drugs, we get spot shortages uh, as well. Um, the uh, area that we're concerned about now is remdesivir because it's being state allocated. We're, we've, uh, we've been fortunate. We're part of the Act 2, Act 3 trials. So some of our patients are on trial. But uh, the state, I believe, is getting either has gotten or will be getting its last allocation from the federal government. And uh, it's clearly not enough to go around given Georgia's case rates. So that's where we see uh, sort of the next and, and most critical shortage coming up. But things like masks, N95s, still, we're still uh, have re re-sterilization and you know, multi-day use for some of them. Um, we, we've uh, isolation gowns, disinfecting wipes. For whatever reason, we just cannot get disinfecting wipes, which it seems so crazy, such a low-tech thing. And uh, that's probably our shortest supply uh, of, of anything. We track uh, on, a daily, on a daily basis, and um, most things were over 45 days of supply. Um, again, based since we, as we've stocked up since learning the hard way in March. Um, but there are still things, uh, there's still a few things that are just difficult to obtain. Um, yeah, disinfecting wipes has been a challenge for us too. You know, one of the questions that came up was around whether um, we used our crisis standards of care. Um, and so I'm curious as to the experience of all of you as to whether we used it. We, um, we did have remdesivir challenges early on as well. We were in the middle of the surge. The EUA came out before the data came out. The EUA had a very expanded definition of who should receive it, and it wasn't entirely clear and who should get it, and, um, and that we were definitely going to need to prioritize. I'm wondering if anybody has uh, used their crisis standards of care. Um, and then maybe one other comment I'll say is we spent a lot of time trying to ensure that all of our patients had living, or all of our patients had living wells. Um, this was an extraordinary effort because it was very clear that some people were coming into the emergency room who might not have wanted intubation but didn't have a living well. And um, we certainly didn't want to give a ventilator to somebody who um, didn't want it, um, especially when somebody else might. You know, I'll just offer, um, we have not used our crisis care standards um, and just implementing them um, was really a challenge. I mean, I remember I, my background was I started as a nurse and I remember years ago, you know, the whole ethics and, and how do we do this? And so it was really fascinating to watch our clinicians and our ethicists come together and really realize that this is something that was real and it could happen. We actually worked with the states 
to try to get the states to take the lead. And in most cases they did because it was really about all hospitals. I mean, where do we stand? Um, but we've not used them. You know, on the question of, of living will, we, we, um, we've been very, very focused as a system on making sure that advanced directives and all of that happens when our, when our, with our members. Had an, int an interesting experience though where, and this is about the culture again and, and people, you know, just the whole culture of sensitivity where an individual who was La a Latinx came in, was actually doing well, but in the course of the conversation about advanced directive, really misinterpreted um, what he was being told and understood that we were asking him if he was basically, you know, okay dying. And, and, and I actually got a call from this individual's employer um, late at night, you know, not understanding what was going on and thinking that somehow we as a health system had given up on him. And, and you know, the opposite was really true, but the, you know, the, the, just in that moment of crisis, having people come in with such volume and, and really walking them through the procedure and, and trying to prepare for all that we, we thought we might deal with was really challenging and, and really a cultural disconnect for a lot of our patients and our members. Yeah, so we've had a, uh, a, a similar journey through our bioethicists, our clinicians, our community members. I, the, today I had a board meeting with my uh, board, uh, my Emory Healthcare Board, and went through uh, the, the triage, as we were calling it, ethical triage uh, process. And fortunately, we've not had to implement it. But we are, we're ready. We've, we've got all the systems in place ready to go. And I think remdesivir is going to be the, the time we turn it on uh, in, the, in the relatively near future. Could folks speak about what you've done outside the hospital for your vulnerable communities? Um, I've heard it said that uh, isolation and quarantine is a privilege. Right, um, as I think someone spoke to this. We um, we stood up a hotel in one of our vulnerable communities and and um, staffed it so that people who cannot isolate at home could isolate in the hotel during their period of time. Have have other people done creative things to help the communities who are who are not necessarily under your roof? I I could talk more on the policy end of this rather than the practical uh, from what the hospitals are doing. But I think one of the issues that we have been speaking a fair amount about is the isolation of those particularly who are elderly living alone uh, and I, I feel for them I really do because I feel that here they are sitting let's say 85 years of age and not knowing when this is going to end not able to interact because they are the most vulnerable recognizing that there's not a therapy right now that's available uh, and as a gen uh, age group which they may not eat something because they just feel like you know, this is just what happens, you're living by yourself. So we're working sort of a lot on sort of communications and how you can use uh, technology to get to connect them. But it's also a, an age that is not as facile with some of the technologies. They are, I'm not, I don't want to be like ages or anything, but I'm just sort of saying that you, you, I'm thinking more about my own mom. And so like she'll use the face, she'll use uh, FaceTime, but it's not the same as somebody who's 30 years old. Uh, so I think it's really important to sort of make sure they're connected. Uh, and also when it comes to the basic needs, we've spoken to pharmacies about medication delivery. We've also spoken a little bit about food delivery. I think there needs to be a more of a buddy system. We put, we, we put this out as a, as a possibility of developing some kind of buddy system where someone knows to check on somebody else to be sure that they have what they need uh, and to be sure that they're available. Uh, you know, right now it's summertime, but you know, in, in the winter, it gets pretty cold in upstate New York and, and people aren't so quick to travel. Um, but that's uh, some of the issues. And then we're looking at sort of what policies we could do as well. But I'll turn to those who are in the health system right now. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just uh, briefly, we, our uh, main effort so far has been in communication. We realized back in March when one of our African-American board members mentioned that in his community, no one was masking, no one was social distancing. People didn't think this was real. Uh, and so we stood up a, a committee, uh, you know, broadly a diverse committee uh, within the organization to help communicate. And as part of that, we brought in both uh, African American and, and uh, Latinx physicians, celebrities, sports stars to do videos. 
to try to get in, 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 a, in a manner that, again, um, these communities aren't gonna listen to me, right? But they're gonna listen to somebody who looks like them, who sounds like them, who's, who understands the cultural references. And that's been really successful in, in working to improve uh, the understanding um, within these communities. Uh, so, um, but it still is a challenge, especially the multi-generational households in the, in the Latinx communities are a big, a big challenge for us. Yeah. You know, I, I would add that in um, most of our states, we've worked with um, community organizations or with the state, to, to your point, to actually set up housing, um, motels, um, et cetera. We've also um, put in place um, what we're calling kind of a, a home kit. So if a member um, is um, diagnosed as positive, we actually have a call center that's set up. Um, we have a kit that goes to that member, to the family that has instructions, masks, gloves, disinfectants. Um, and then there's a conversation that occurs about you know, quarantining, isolation. What does that mean? Um, we are working with, uh, in a number of our communities, with community organizations where there isn't contact tracing or, or um, staff actually to actually um, set up community organizations with resources that would take on some of that responsibility and collaborate and work with um, counties. I mean, when, you, when we look at um, our population and we look at the percentage of African Americans that we have as members, and the percentage of them that are positive or the percentage of Latinx that we have as members and the percentage that are positive. I mean, it's very clear that the group um, kind of most affected by this are people of color um, um, and really, you know, tailoring programs that are specific to them, working with churches um, where, like John and others, really working to have individuals that are part of the community also be a voice in helping to educate and, and to lead and, and teach. Right. Um, maybe I will take the opportunity to ask for one line from each of you of the biggest gift that you've gotten out of this because it's been a lot of sad, a lot of hard. Has there been anything, what's been the silver lining? Dr. Lewin? Sure. For us, it's really organizationally. Um, as you know, with, with uh, you know, 11 hospitals and, and academics and being a system has been very challenging. Every local unit wanted to live on its own and every, their culture was sacrosanct. And I would say what this has done is it's brought our system years ahead of where we would have otherwise been in really, in, in being a system in looking at common, you know, every one of our ICUs across all of our hospitals are using exactly the same guidelines. That never would have happened. I would in my lifetime. I don't think <laughs> I would. Um, and so that really, for us as an organization, um, it's brought the people together. It's brought the system together, and that's been, I think, the biggest positive. Mr. Adams. Well, John um, kind of stole my thunder <laughs> there. Thirty-eight <laughs> hospitals. Same. You know, the other thing I would add, though, is that um, you know what's happened with virtual care is just amazing. Um, and we were on a journey, we were owning that, and yet we just overnight um, moved. And our patient satisfaction is through the roof uh, in, in most cases. Um, you know, our productivity is up. And so we're now looking at how do we hardwire? How do we, you know, really um, have the right assessments in terms of quality, et cetera. So I think all that John said, I think the, you know, the virtual care shift, and I think it's changed the culture and the mindset of our people and clinicians. I mean, the, 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 this, the innovation and the togetherness is, is in an entirely different place. So echo, John. Great, Dr. Zucker. I think my answer is an unusual one. It's because at first you may think it's not a positive, but it's, it's looking down the road is why I think it's a positive. I think what this did is it unmasked the issues that we've all been saying about the health inequities and that there's, there's an issue of who, what kind of care, um, that, that there's uh, disparities in health care in America. And, and I think this showed this even more because I think this pandemic um, accentuated a lot of the things that we've already known about. I think down the road, everyone's going to be better off for this because they have seen these inequities that are there 
in such a uh, such a visceral way. And I think that we as a nation will be more fortunate in the long run. And in that vein, could I add, it is also shown the need that we have to fund and the resource public health. That I, that I would wholeheartedly agree with. So maybe I will just weave together some common themes that um, I certainly felt and I know that we heard. Um, I think we all recognize that um, this became a team sport very quickly and that we really needed a multidisciplinary approach. And I mean multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary even beyond medicine. Um, we needed infrastructure, we needed, um, we needed stock, stock piles, we needed, um, we needed conversations outside to our SNFs and our long-term care facilities. We just needed, we needed a lot of people at this table in places um, that we might not have reached for before just in thinking about our own uh, walls in medicine. I think we all heard that testing had been the Achilles heel, it probably remains the Achilles heel, and that folks who are able to sort of developed their own tests and had a little bit of independence, were able to do a lot more and were be able to triage a lot faster. An incredible role for innovation. We didn't talk a lot about it, but I know in all of our spaces, we've been innovating from a data standpoint, from a from surgical mask standpoint, we had hexapods that we were using for testing so we didn't have to use PPE. Um, to do our testing. Um, so a, a really important role for innovation, a critical role for data. I think following the data and not just looking retrospectively, but looking prospectively and projecting what you might expect you could, you will find and you will see, gives you a real sense of where you're going and, and it allows you to think through what tomorrow is going to hold because tomorrow is a whole different day. Um, I think, uh, you know, we spoke a lot about our vulnerable communities and, and Dr. Zucker, your point is very well taken. Um, we have sort of uh, really, uh, if it wasn't obvious before, which it should have been, we really unmasked some really key disparities that I think um, merit critical attention beyond this pandemic. Um, the important role of communication, um, I do think that even when we don't know the answer, it is important to be out there and to tell you what we know so that it can be very transparent. Um, I would say early and often is probably the best communication. Um, and really the important, state, the important about caring for one another um, because um, I think all of us are stressed, all of us were not sleeping a lot, all of us um, were, were forced into tasks and asked questions where we didn't know the answer and it was unfamiliar territory. And I think all of that um, led to uncertainty and stress. And if you don't care for one another, then um, that became very hard. So maybe with that, I will close and just thank everyone, thank our speakers, really. This was truly a wonderful conversation. I want to thank everyone who registered for today's uh, webinar, um, we'll, and you will receive an invitation for the next webinar. Um, the, this webinar has been recorded, and the recording, a transcript, and the slide presentations will be available on COVID19conversations.org. I want to again thank our panelists um, and to the APHA and the National Academy of Medicine for sponsoring this webinar series. I want to thank you, our listeners, for joining us today, wherever you are around the country, around the world. We know you are tackling these critical challenges, um, and so we wish you luck in doing so. Best wishes to all of you for staying healthy. Please take care of yourself and one another. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.